Why don't we go ahead and get started? I won't take up too much of your time. My name is Gary Muller. I'm the VP of Business Development for Zico Corporation, and you must have read, that's a great crowd. Um, I thought nobody was going to attend, actually. I'll be looking at drones and all kinds of other stuff. But, um, but we're a software developer, and we've built an application called Public Eye. So I'm going to show you a little bit about Public Eye, but what I'd really like to talk to you today about is smart policing using smartphones and tablets. And so I'm going to show you a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about the technology, a couple of ground rules. I never give the same presentation twice, and I enjoy conversations. So please, by all means, if you have any questions, feel free to ask about that. Um, we've been for about two and a half years now looking very, very closely at the technologies that are enabled by um, today's modern mobile devices, smartphones and tablets. So there's a lot we know about them and what the technology can do, and we're learning every day as we further deploy our application into police, fire, and EMS a lot about how you need to use it. Um, I actually have uh, asked Craig Withacombe here. Craig, raise your hand. For those who don't know Craig, he's the officer in charge of IT at the Lowell Police Department. Um, he was our first customer and helped guide us, so if you don't like anything about the product, it's because he wanted it that way. And if you liked it, it's because we made some fixes. <laughs> Um, but it's an it's evolving capability. No, Craig has been uh, outstanding to work with. The Lowell Police Department, you're up to now 60, 70 tablets. 70 tablets out in a mobile environment all the way from the command staff down into the cars. So when it comes to the rubber hits the road, Craig's actually uh, a fantastic resource and he's been gracious enough to, you know, when we push customers his way that want to know questions about mounts and power and all those other pragmatics. Um, please feel free to call Craig and the, um, uh, Debbie, the chief at, at um, Lowell, is very supportive of us as well, so, um, so they're having a good time with it. So I just want to, um, uh, actually I want to start by making an announcement, and it's, you'll hear it here first. Um, we have been promoting um, our application on iOS devices, and I'm going to actually demonstrate from iOS devices today. Um, but we've uh, talked about and we've announced Android devices, and the Android devices general availability is rolling out this month. But for those who um, are Microsoft fans, here's a Microsoft Windows 8 tablet, and you see a prototype of our same application. So the announcement's going out today over the wire and everything else. So um, we're mobile app developers. Um, company's been in business for like 24 years. And um, we have about 300 mobile app developers in our stable, so we tackle everything. We do apps for the Verizons, Teva Pharmaceuticals, you know, John Hancock, whatever. So we do a lot of commercial work. Um, but we've also gone ahead and done um, a lot of work now in police and fire. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. If you have any questions or you want to have a dialogue about something, feel free to, to, um, to jump in. Um, we talk about um, smart policing. Um, and what is that? So there's a lot of aspects of smart policing, but improving policy, uh, uh, ugh, too much coffee this morning, improving policing performance and effectiveness and at the same time controlling costs is the official definition or one of the official definitions. So my question to all of us is how can smartphones and tablets do this? And I, I know a lot of you around here already have tablets in one form or another, so you're going to be able to just chime right in on this. But to set the stage, um, the, and I probably shouldn't be standing in the way, but um, there's, been a, there's been a steady, steady decline in the actual use of and purchase of PCs. And we're seeing it quite extensively. Um, if I talk to Salt Lake City uh, Police Department, you know, they're acquiring 350 iPads. Um, if I talk to um, the um, well, let me pick an Android customer. Um, <clears throat> nor, uh, Metropolitan Washington Transit, 475 Android devices they're deploying, tablets they're deploying. So there's a significant move um, to move from um, the ruggedized notebook computer, the MDT, you know, to uh, a tablet device. And while nobody might be just junking them, we've talked to a lot of customers that are saying, I, you know, I want to move away from tablets, I want to move away from ruggedized MDTs, special purpose MDTs, and, you know, move to something else. And so we're seeing, especially during the end of life, so um, we've picked up customers that have said, you know, I'm in the end of lifing, you know, all of these machines, what do I go to? 
Um, there are some key advantages of smartphones and tablets, and we'll go through some of them uh, during this presentation. One is, and this is one that I like to harp on, is that the geospatial and graphic nature of what we can do on a tablet interface is so, far superior than even what we can do in a traditional Windows environment. Now, I come from a traditional Windows environment. Um, so if you're running um, you know, those other operating systems, you don't have a touch screen interface. And um, in a past life, I used to work for Xerox and very involved in the research at Palo Alto Research Center where we pioneered a lot of graphic design, use of color, use of a variety of techniques. And I can tell you that the law enforcement business, especially out there on the streets, is very focused on geography and very focused on quick and accurate information they need to get to with, a, with one or two clicks, we used to say, or now one or two touches of your fingertip. Uh, and you be, need to be able to interpret that. And the difference between a command line interface or a simple graphic to what we can do nowadays on tablets um, will typically, when the studies are all in, provide you with inf information access about twice as fast and comprehension 30 to 40 percent faster. So obviously these devices, besides being lightweight and less power and all of that, provide a significant advantage to you. There's no navigational hardware, of course, no mouse or whatever else, no touchpad, you can just touch the screen directly. These types of things provide you with the ability to access information quickly, and I'll show you some of that. Um, uh, now how does that, um, how does that portray itself? Well, here's a, a screenshot of, of our product, but I think I'm logged in. So if you will switch me over to HDMI, uh, we're going to use our own product to demonstrate some of these simply because we're a sponsor, we get to do that. Uh, but if it comes up, so um, this is just running off of my iPad. But whether it was our application or some of the other applications we're seeing in the marketplace now, very graphical and very geographical. And if I want to get access to information, I'm sorry, I'm going to lean over you a lot. Um, you know, I'm going to literally touch one particular pin and I'm going to bring up information. And I'm going to bring it up very, very quickly. The technology of mobile devices, and by the way, I could be doing this on my phone or I could be doing it on a, you know, you know pick your favorite uh, mobile device, um, not Blackberry. But we can bring up information. And then you can use navigational controls to be able to, you know, just swipe a finger and see additional types of information. So this concept of um, a geographical area, and the reason I like to bring this up, if I just kind of slide this, is, is this is my 911 call. My neighborhood area is a circle that is set there. And if you notice down here when you bring up details from any particular CAD system, RMS system, third party system, um, you can get information about that particular address of the call, but you can also get geographical awareness of other hazards other objects nearby that you'd want to be. If you get a call for 123 Main Street, you may end up going to 124 Main Street or down the street or whatever. So with these graphic devices, you now can get, you can paint a picture of other incidents, other objects within a certain area so you kind of have an understanding of what's in the neighborhood. These are the kinds of information now that with tablets can be brought up very, very quickly and very, very easily and provide for a much more uh, quick look at the map you know, what can I see? I've got, a, I've got a medium priority call there, use of color. There's another medium priority call not too far away. It's flashing, so whatever your convention is in your system, that for us means that it's unassigned call. Um, I've got a level one sex offender, level three sex offender. The point is, is that with GUIs now that have access to those back end systems that you have, CAD, RMS, ESRI, Wherever those, uh, that information is, we've even done some where people are saying, well, I get a spreadsheet every two weeks from the state of new prison release. Fine. Once that's in the system, it can be made available to officers. So the key part of any deployment of technology on a pad is make it fast and make it easy that everybody can comprehend in a visual mode. And that is a, a, a superior approach to take. And we've seen that show up in a variety of products, even outside of police and fire. So if you would go ahead and switch me back. Thank you. I'm going to keep you busy. Um, <clears throat> so I'll let the screen catch up. Um, but in any case, um, one of the values of the mobile devices, of course, is, is mobility. And 
you, you kind of say, well, I had that because I had these devices and they were bolted into the car, so isn't that mobile? And, and the answer is, yeah, that's mobile, but a lot of times what was brought forward in that mobile environment was a traditional GUI that was not designed for mobile. All right? So as Craig likes to say it, how did you say that, Craig? You, it's your data made mobile is a different, right. So, um, so the key thing that you want to do when you deploy and you want to look for in mobile devices is you're not just extending that traditional interface um, from one or more back-end systems into a mobile environment because you're not doing anything to assist and making use of all the, the newer techniques to, to manage and organize data for quick comprehension. And that's what we work on is hard. What you want to do is you want to make the data mobile, which means touchscreen interfaces, geographical based, pins in the right area, what have you. Um, but the other big opportunity with mobile devices is, of course, the fact that you don't have to keep them in the cars. Um, you can literally have them out, be seeing them on your smartphone, using your tablet out on a walk. In, in some cases, in these two cases here, you can't see it, but they're actually talking to a victim or talking to a witness and bringing up information and showing them information. Was it this street? Was it that street? Was it this person? Was it that person? Depending upon the type of information, you now can engage with your community and the people involved on an incident or accident or whatever it is and um, engage them in conversation and everything and use this device in that role. That's something you couldn't do because I don't think too many people invite you into the cruiser to sit down next to the MDT. It just doesn't happen. Um, so it's really important to understand that these devices are truly mobile. Um, we've got officers using them on phones. They're on a beat patrol. Um, we've got um, an organization that is deploying tablets, and they're going with a smaller tablet. They're going with the, the iPad mini in this one particular case that I'm thinking of. Um, because they're lightweight, they fit in the cargo pants. You know, they can put them in a bike saddle or whatever. And so there's a variety of ways that you can use these devices. And so you want to be... Uh, taking a look at when you make decisions about phone versus mini tablet versus tablet, um, you've got to ask yourself questions about you know, how convenient is it going to be for the officer to use, if I put a case on it, how, how heavy is it going to be, what kind of um, data uh, service am I going to put on it, am I using Verizon, am I using AT&T, do I have Wi-Fi, public sector Wi-Fi in my community, um, what are my options, and uh, we can answer a lot of questions if you have about that. Um, we've worked closely with Verizon. We're starting to work more closely with AT&T about how to set these devices up. Um, especially, is anybody here not from Massachusetts? Yay, okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about your kind. <laughs> I don't know what you have down there, but, uh, but follow along with me and then we'd figure it out. Um, where were you from? Green Bay, Wisconsin. Oh, cool. Welcome. I don't know what you're using. Are you using Verizon out there? Or? Verizon. Okay. Most people use Verizon out there, and with Verizon, um, what we recommend doing, and I know what Lowell's done, is, is you set them up so that you use static IP addresses, and that helps on a variety. And so these devices can carry a static IP address, and I would recommend that. Um, now some of the things that you can do that aren't that easy to do with non-mobile devices. And again, I'm going to try to keep this generic to mobile devices. And one, obviously, is their surveillance portals. So you can, you can literally tie in camera systems from a variety of places. And we're seeing more and more interest. Actually, we saw a peak after Sandy Hook about, can I connect to schools? Yes. Can I connect to cameras that the police department or municipalities may have around town? Yes. Can I connect to private? Yes. Um, it all, it's, it's more a sense of policy than it is of technology nowadays and being able to connect to surveillance systems. These are really, really important. Um, so if you've you know, got an incident at a school or something, if you can check the cameras down the hall and you know, find out what's going on before you rush in the front door, we think it's an extremely valuable thing to do. It only, should only take you a minute or two. In fact, if I can get you to switch back to the HDMI, um, let me just bring up a, um, a surveillance system and we'll see. So, <clears throat> so with the touch of a button, what I did is I just touched um, this, little, this little pin up here, um, which is it was an icon for a surveillance system, just to indicate how quickly and easy it is you can get to a surveillance system. 
Um, this happens to be a very simple one for demonstration purposes. We've got three cameras on. One is not on because it's red. But the real concept is how fast can I get to camera number two? Well, I can literally just put my finger in and swish over that, and it'll bring me to camera number two. And this is actually fairly slow um, from what we normally get. No, well, they're on, they're on IP addresses. Um, these particular for ones for demonstration, I could give you the IP and you could get access to them as well. But, um, but there's a variety of systems out there. It could be a Genetech system, uh, it could be public IP, they could be private IP. Um, we're working with the Lowell School District to start wiring in their cameras so if an incident goes down on a school, not only can the PD in the police department see it, but what about the, the guys that are on directed patrol in the school? How fast can they be sitting there with their phone saying, you know, let me go down hall two, before I go down hall two or hall three, let me just stop a second and, and um, you know, swipe through the images. If they were behind a firewall. Yes. You had a VPN running? Um, there's different ways we can set it up technically. There's, there, um, in our case, um, on these particular uh, images, um, it's a uh, static IP address and port numbers, and there's a camera login. Okay, so I mean, the different systems can do it different ways, but fact of the matter is, um, if we can tie into your surveillance system, we'll tie in your surveillance system. Um, if the officers that log in to our particular product have the rights, they'll be able to get to those cameras right away. So even an officer on directed patrol in Lowell High School can, you know, if they're authorized automatically whether there's an incident going down or not. But putting the camera in one of the banks downtown, you know, that camera feed from, um, from the lobby wouldn't be triggered and activated unless there was an alarm that went off. And then all of a sudden the police not only in the, at headquarters could look at it, but it also could be seen by an officer whose you know, patrol beat is right in that area. I mean, he might be around the corner for that matter and can instantly bring up that camera. So this is where the technology is going. The ability to handle this kind of information quickly and easily and get it into the officer's hands is, is an important part. Um, and then you know, things like Verizon LTE, you know, or the, the speeds keep getting better. Um, and you can make some intelligent decisions as well, depending upon number of camera feeds. Now, this one was easy. Uh, am I still on? Yeah, I'm not on my slides, but um, and this one's easy because I only have, in the thumbnails, I only have two cameras and then the third one's off. But we've got systems that we're tying into that, you know, could have 20, 30 cameras to it, and the officer can, you know, swipe through those or do whatever they want to in terms of um, being able to... Um, you know, see those camera systems and, and go through those. Again, as long as they have, sorry, <laughs> as long as they have access. So, and, and this is our particular implementation, but there's a lot of them out there. I mean, in Genetech builds their own um, iPad-based capability. We've just integrated it so it's all effective for uh, an officer. But, um, but again, the key is, is that with the, with the speeds of the technology of the uh, devices, the ability to connect, everybody seems to be moving to IP-based cameras. The technology is giving you the point where getting access to important visual information from surveillance systems should be on everybody's radar screen. Um, we've even um, had some conversations with uh, Redlands, California. You, you might have seen that they're a pioneer of using iPads, and, and they're telling us that um, the Walmarts and the Kmarts of the world are very happy to have conversations about tying in the police department should an incident go down in their store. Um, so that those feeds can be made available to them. Again, it's more policy and it's more um, what the business wants to do in terms of giving you ability to, um, to access camera feeds. Um, would you switch me back, please? It's one of the other things that you can do, which is extremely, I think, easy to do, um, but it has always been an issue, as that is, is when you're trying to get surveillance systems information out from private institutions, you're dealing with codex. And, and, the ability to connect to and, and uh, find a, a way to get those, that imagery out. A very simple solution is literally use the camera on your device, take a picture of the screen of the, of the image that was caught um, by the convenience store, in this case, whatever, and then simply send it out to all officers on duty or within a patrol area and everything. And, and you, know, you can do that natively with your iPhone. And essentially, in a matter of moments, you know, that particular image can be sent to every patrol officer on duty within a five or 10 mile radius 
um, and uh, you may want to deal with the entire um, footage later from the surveillance system, but in terms of apprehending a suspect or providing quick visual information to other people that need to know, these devices make it extremely easy to do. And so I encourage everybody to really understand what their uh, smartphones and tablets can do. Um, this, is, um, this has been a very, very effective. Um, and, and again, you're not dealing with any conversion going on anywhere from IT. Uh, the other thing about mobile devices um, that a lot of people don't realize is that they can make very, very effective reporting. Now, I just took a form that we just implemented, but it doesn't matter what type of form it could be. It could be a incident report. It can be an accident report. Um, we're implementing um, victim witness statements and, and a variety of different reports. All of these reports can be done in a mobile environment and, and just use your iPad like you would n normally use your, your MDT or whatever. You can, there's no reason why you can't use a mobile device. But you can use native interfaces. Native interfaces reports can be done in a native interface. One of the things we like about doing them in a native uh, interface on the mobile device is the fact that uh, you can provide a lot more information, pull downs, what have you. Um, you can store it locally, you can transmit it back to your server or, exp or import it back to your CAD system or whatever in your workflow um, at any time you want, um, but it just makes it a lot easier. And there's a lot we can do with the GUI to make it more effective. So this program yeah. wouldn't be replacing what you have, it would be kind of supplementing it? Or well, in, in our case with ours, yes. Um, there are some CAD and RMS vendors that are working on some type of mobile interface. The early ones that we've seen tend to be Windows-like. They're really just extending their Windows or it's, it's, this is not, in our case, it's not HTML5 for the most part, um, which means I'm just providing you with a, a web browser interface into their application. We actually build native applications. So if you get offline, you still have a lot of working capability, knowledge, cache data, whatever that you can use. Either way, um, the point is, is that if you, as long as you can bring up that information, you can go ahead and, and uh, do reports in a mobile environment, Just get to a certain point, hit draft, hit save, and then, and then move on um, if you've got another call. <clears throat> um, another key feature about these devices, and I've already talked a little bit about the camera, is that these devices can scan barcodes. These devices can scan a variety of things. So um, I've just given you some examples. Um, that's the back of my driver's license. That's, that's the, um, it's my wife's car. <laughs> um, but you'll notice that it's a registration and it's got a 2D barcode here. There's a 2D barcode on my driver's license. Um, <clears throat> it really doesn't matter anymore. Um, what those is, but these devices are cameras, so I'm recommending that you take a hard look when you're deploying mobile devices. Um, think about the hardware savings that you have. You don't have to have separate barcode readers in the cars anymore. All right, you literally can use this, I mean, probably everybody who owns a smart device is, who has not scanned a QR code at least once? Oh, there you go. Everybody has. So whether it's a QR code, whether it's a 2D barcode or whatever, that information is available. Uh, drivers can be built and you can use these devices. So again, now we're talking a little bit about the cost factor and the efficiency of mobile devices and smart policing. Uh, you don't have to have um, that information um, captured by a separate device. The same is true for OCR. There's no reason why these devices can't be used in order to capture the image for OCR. Okay, so you know whether it's the number down here, the number on the inspection, Massachusetts, you have barcodes, I understand, right, on your, um, or here's the VIN off the side of the door. All of these can be read. In that case, there's a barcode and text, but you can read these now with devices. So that provides you with the ability to, you know, check the registration, check the, check the VIN, capture this information, get it pre-populated into any kind of report that you need to use. So one of the powerful aspects of being able to take the device, whether it's the iPad mini or the iPad, the Surface tablet and whatever, and I think I showed you the Surface tablet, right? So we're, we are supporting the Windows one. I didn't bring an Android one, figured Microsoft wouldn't care. Um, but you can, you can scan these things and you can capture all that information for reporting, for reporting purposes, pre-populate pre reports, 
and be able to be much more efficient. If it's a ruggedized notebook computer or something and it's bolted in the car, you've lost that effectiveness, really. You really want to go, I mean, we kind of have a vision that, you know, you know, welcome to the 21st century where, um, you know, law enforcement runs on smartphones. I mean, you pretty much can do everything I've shown you. I'm showing you on the tablet. But most of these functions are very effective on the phone. Um, given a smaller screen size, they're very effective on the phone. So think about that when you deploy any type of application. What do I need? What type of device do I want to give the officer? What is he going to do, use it for? Is he going to be scanning registrations? Is he going to be um, doing a lot of work? Maybe e-ticketing, again, another thing that you can be done on the phone. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about, and one of the things that is of value um, that could be done on PCs, but we're, we're actually doing it now on smart devices, is the ability to actually um, connect to remote, uh, or excuse me, to um, records management systems and actually show the officer in the, um, in the car, you know, hey, where have the, where have the car jacks, uh, car brakes have been? Where's B&Es have been? Where have the assaults been over the last 24, 48 hours or whatever? Um, if we call that uh, educated patrol, and we actually stole that from, you know, somebody over in Lowell that, that mentioned it. Um, but the concept of smart policing is to make smart decisions in a mobile environment. Well, if you're just coming on duty after being off for a week or a long weekend or something like that, you have no idea really what's, what's been going on unless it hit the news or, you know, you're talking about it in the locker room or somebody mentioned it at roll call or whatever. Here, the officer can sit down and say, show me where the car brakes have been or show me, I've heard there's a fair amount of car brakes where they've been or where the assaults have been and make some educated decisions about where and how they're going to turn left, turn right. Okay, a lot of them happened up in the northwest area of my um, patrol area. I'll patrol that a little heavier tonight. Um, this is not done after crime analysis group gets it, massages the data for two weeks, presents it to the command staff, and then an officer might get an email that he might look at and when he gets a break and whatever and try to understand that. This is real time. And this is where the technology is going. I don't, you know, st stuff that you should be demanding now for your officers is how do you give them the information they can make intelligent decisions themselves about what's going on and how, how it went on? What have been the prior calls for the last couple of days? You know, where the breaks have been? That kind of information is, is now, the technology is there to do that. It's just another map layer that they can turn on and off and, and make some intelligent, simple queries about getting that information. So I'm just kind of pulling that screen out of here into um, into a larger screen so you can see that. But, sure. Our office is able to get their passwords if they forget them without bothering us. <laughs> um, <laughs> it depends upon how the technology is implemented. In our situation, if they've forgotten their password right now, they're going to bother you. And then you're going to bother them for forgetting that. Um, we can talk a little bit about two-factor authentication for CGIS, though, but <laughs> username and password, and then, you know, and then you need something, okay? Now, I talked about a barcode scanner, right? So we can literally, you know, if, if they want to log into a mobile device tablet and they have their own cell phone, we can send a one-time use um, OOB, OTP, I think I have a slide on that, one-time use password out of, out of band, which means that it's going to meet CGIS compliance, 5.2. Um, and they can do that. One of the things that's also acceptable, um, according to the new policy, is if we scan their driver's license or scan, scan their police ID, okay, so Craig's not happy, he's got to take us out of his wallet, but, um, but we're working on a variety of ways. Um, Worcester, anybody here from Worcester? Worcester uses a uh, R, RSA server. Um, we can connect to the RSA server, Active, Active Directory, we're happy to support that. So um, Anyway, back to Educated Patrol. Again, with understanding real time what's going on out there, we're hopefully in a situation where the offer has better awareness of what's been going down, has better awareness for what he's driving into or, or getting into with a to a response. And, and these are a lot easier when you have mobile devices. As soon as he steps out of that car with the ruggedized notebook computer, he's not going to get that. Whereas if all of a sudden something's going down and he's up, you know, at the front door, which happened to me on one or two occasions in our house, and he's got his mobile device with him, he'll get a push notification. 
about something. Yeah. And it could come from the crime center, it could come from the CAD system, it could come from a variety of areas. It makes the officer not feel like when he's left the car now he's, he's out of touch. Um, I want to talk a little bit about cost. <coughs> this is an actual quote I got from you. <laughs> Great. Um, but this was a quote for a Panasonic. I don't have anything against the Panasonic guys. Um, they make some good tablets and stuff we're supporting. Um, but it's $3,800, and that doesn't include all the other things that go into that. That whole quote, by the time you were done, was like six grand quote um, with, you know, the mounts and the, every, the Gamber Johnson mount and all that kind of stuff. But, but what this particular line item is, is the unit and, of course, it came with a keyboard. So just to give you a cost comparison, I put together a chart that says, well, what if it were an Apple iPad with Retina Display, fourth generation, 16 gigabyte? Which, by the way, as an appliance, well, that's all you need. Um, it's all you need to run what we're doing. And then if you get a keyboard, and we, we kind of like the BT-80, um, total 798. So if I throw out the mounting hardware on both sides, which will be cheaper on the iPad, and the power supply and everything else, but just look at the device itself with the keyboard, you're saving almost 80%. Now, I think that's an important in your equation. Um, so if you're saving that type of thing, you can buy three or four times as much uh, in terms of being able to deploy and mobilize your, your workforce out there. For most customers, that iPad will not replace a laptop. It won't. It will. And let, it, or, it or, will. or a Surface but device. But that $800 it doesn't tell you the whole story. There's lack of group policy. There's lack of control over the devices, which also costs money. Right. If you want to deploy iPads and you want to control them, and you want to secure them, you need third-party applications to do that. So you're like my straight man. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Um, the CGIS policy that came out, one of the, f the first things you saw in it, and I'll just jump right to it, is mobile device management. So if you are looking at deploying mobile devices, um, 5.2 of the CGIS uh, policy has a great discussion in there about uh, mobile device management. A lot of you are going to face, whether or not you put those in the car, you're going to face that issue anyway because, you're, because departments, either the command staff has them and or the detectives has them, they're out there. I mean, I rarely go to a presentation anymore to a prospective customer or customer and they don't show up with their iPads. In fact, some of you guys have shown up with your iPads. So you're really going to have to address this as part of the infrastructure whether you put them in the cars or not. And you can get mobile device managers that will support all the different mobile devices out there. So it's actually a very good way to go because that, that it used to be, and I would walk into a police department and say, oh, we can't use Apple or whatever we were pitching at the time. Why? Well, because it's not an approved, uh, approved security device. Well, the cryptographic modules have now been approved. There's ways to connect, you know, all of these devices through a FIPS 140-2 compliant VPN connection. There's software out there that does that. Yes, there's those third parties. Um, Cambridge actually has it. They have, uh, they use Columba Tech for their... Um, connecting their mobile devices back to the back-end CGIS environment, uh, my understanding. But you're going to have to address that because it's there. And by the way, um, you don't have to buy that software. It, you can use it as an expense line item. It costs you like $4 a month per device to use MDM in the cloud. And I already know police departments that are doing that. So um, one other thing about CGIS, um, we talked about this before. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it does require cryptographic storage on your devices. So you want to make sure your devices have gone through the NIST validated, um, their encryption modules have been um, validated by NIST, NIST, to do that. Um, so we've been tracking that heavily. And then the, the pre-11i protocols are not sufficient, so you're going to be looking uh, most likely at wanting to do an actually uh, FIPS compliant VPN. And there's third party software. NetMotion does it. Um, Columba Tech does it. There are other ones out there that do that. You're going to have to pay for that. The good news is you, you buy the server license once um, and the client licenses. And I know jurisdictions that have bought it in police, but then Fire are using it or they're using it for other services. So sometimes when you think about your purchasing decisions in terms of MDM, purchasing decisions in, in terms of third party software for deploying these devices, Think beyond your department. Um, we have regional dispatch areas. Um, we're doing a job for Merrimack County Sheriff's Office. They only have to have one MDM 
um, and one license for uh, Columbia Tech um, to secure the secure connection to the devices, and yet they dispatch to Allenstown, Boscawan, and all these other towns that if you're out of town, sorry, you won't know. But, um, but they're a regional dispatch area um, in the sheriff's office. So there's way, and we've actually seen some cases where the fire department and the police department are, are chipping in for that infrastructure cost because it's actually run by the city. Um, you know, Hudson, New Hampshire is the city IT group, for instance. Um, so when they deploy it and they get familiar when your back end, uh, when, or maybe you guys and your resources um, are deploying these, these, the back end parts to, that manage these devices, um, you end up um, learning about it for one part of your, your city or township, but it supports the rest of the organization as well at really no additional cost, depending upon how you're deployed. Um, where am I? I think I talked about all of that. Um, hard and soft tokens, we've talked about RSA, we've talked about scanning barcode. There's actually an organization, um, Stanton, Virginia, that doesn't have the barcode scanning that they want, so they're actually using QR codes taped to the back of the badge of the officer as their second factor authentication. There's various ways you can do that. Again, you know, who doesn't have a QR code reader on their, on their uh, device? The thing you have to do is, is whether you're scanning, and then I'll just tip, when you're scanning a barcode or a QR code or using something for a second factor authentication, that second factor authentication has to be done back at the server. So you can't store the match for the QR code or the match for on the device itself. That has to go back to the server. And that's just part of the current policy. And that's a good one. So, um, so think about um, you know, when you deploy mobile devices and you're managing them and you're implementing two-factor authentication, make sure that that um, authentication occurs back at the server. There's something you, you are. Um, I haven't seen too many implementations of this. Uh, fingerprint, everybody's probably heard the announcement about these devices going with fingerprint. Um, retina scan and voice. And actually I've seen more voice of anything else that's deployed in the something you are. Um, those of you familiar with Nuance as a company know that they have very, very accurate uh, voice recognition technology. Um, and I've been involved in deployments of the voice recognition technology in the past. So. Um, you'll see more of these options come together for you. Again, it's usually your CGIS, compli CGIS compliance officer in your state that will have a lot of say about which way you go. Um, the FBI tells us, yeah, go ahead and do barcode scans, but if I go talk to, um, you know, uh, no, let me think of one, uh, Rhode Island. Bill Guy, he wants to use, you know, he handles CGIS compliance for Rhode Island. He, he really wants to see everybody go with tokens. So again, your state compliance officers are going to have a lot to say about the type of technology you deploy. So um, I know when we get involved in an implementation, um, we're trying to check with the states and find out what's going to be acceptable to them um, because we have multiple ways that we can deploy this. That's just something you have to factor in. Um, <clears throat> I thought I would just show you a few headlines. Um, I'll bet you everybody up here is familiar with this comment about the bus driver that um, was beat up and they, they caught the individual in part because of his, his uh, tweeting. Um, it's kind of a cyber version of world's stupidest criminals or whatever that show is. Um, New York Post had something out in April. Um, there's a lot of use of these mobile devices by criminals as well and so one of the things that you can do and I'll show you this. If you'll switch me back, you can access tweets, social media, any particular post, whether it's um, an Instagram, it is um, a tweet itself, it is a um, Flickr posting, as long as it was done. Oh, there they are. I don't know why I was so slow. Um, these are actually live tweets from this particular area. Um, you can actually access these, and I apologize if in advance there's any bad language. Um, but these are actually live tweets over the next last couple of days. And you'd be amazed at some of the stuff. Actually, during the marathon bombing, we centered the map in, in that area and in Cambridge when they were doing the house to house. And we were calling up tweets from, from all kinds of users and stuff. Um, I think Boston or had some type of an arrangement with Twitter because those tweets weren't staying up very long. They were pulling, being pulled down intentionally, we think. But, um, 
But whatever these are, social media now becomes more and more important and, and you can access that and you can use that for, you can capture this for evidentiary purposes or if you're trying to find people or trying to find out what's going on in a particular neighborhood. Uh, I think my daughter owns Twitter. I mean, she just is always on it. A lot of younger kids are. So you have that ability to access um, from these devices and most people don't realize that. I had a lot of fun not too long ago when I was sitting in my family room and I pulled up the map and I said center on my location and I pulled up all the tweets and I started reading them loud enough my daughter could hear them from her bedroom and she came you know tearing out of her room how did you get to my tweets freaking out it's because they're public um, so I had a lot of fun that <laughs> on that so but again it, those are the types of um, things that can be done and now make it very accessible to people working in the field to do that all right, so fine. Um, would you go ahead and switch me back, please? Um, a couple of other um, recent headlines. Obviously, obviously, there's a pitch for Lowell, who's been early doing that. And then um, I'll, I'll skip them. You can read them. Just you know, um, you can do a search and get all the headlines in the world. There's more and more activity uh, going on. But I wanted to take you to this slide. This actually was interesting. This is um, New Zealand, um, and New Zealand is deploying mobile devices. In this case, they're, they're iOS devices. Um, but I wanted to point out that they actually believe that because they're starting to use them, they're seeing a drop. And this is what smart policing is all about, right? Doing things smart in a mobile environment. 13% um, thir reduction in crime for the year. All right? That's a significant advantage. Um, um, 30 minutes worth of productivity per officer per shift. Okay. Now, these are, this is an organization that already had devices out there and vehicles and everything else, but they moved to truly mobile devices and they're getting these type of productivity gains. And so this is the kind of thing that you should be looking for when you deploy any type of mobile device, iPads, Surface tablets, Android devices, whatever. You want, to, you want to be looking for those gains. There's a justification for moving to that. I would expect all of you in a mobile environment, if you, if you look at the productivity and everything else, you should be able to get these kinds of gains. And I think I'm supposed to have been done probably five minutes ago or whatever, but um, I just want to show you what I think the future of, you can't see it too well in this lighting, mobile devices. Um, how long is, I mean, this picture is 10 years old, I think, on the left. Um, this year or whatever, but um, so there's a phone, there's, a, there's an ID, all right? We've seen, if, you're, if you haven't visited some of the other vendors, I was talking to the guys that do the facial recognition, all right? Again, camera, take a picture of the guy, send it back against the database, find out what it's all about. Surveillance systems, we're, we're doing some deals with the guys with the little tractors. You know, with, you know, be able to, they may have a mobile, uh, a mobile front end. A lot of them do. You can control the device on, on a mobile device. You can pull up that image on that mobile device. And so in our case, what we're doing is we're providing connections so that if you're using those, you can also do them in the same app. But whether you're using the same app or you're pushing the home button and going to a different app, all of those features and capabilities exist. So um, we think there's a lot that mobile technology has to offer. Um, I still think it's in its infancy. Um, again, we're excited about some of the recent um, information coming out from all the different mobile device manufacturers about higher speeds, faster speeds, use of, of, uh, of fingerprinting technology, and there's some third-party third add-on products for that as well that you can use if you want to capture fingerprints in the field. 